Welcome to One Mic Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this episode is about the life of Josh Gibson. As always, hit the subscribe button. Please consider donating to our Patreon page. And if you like this, review us on Apple Podcasts. Without further ado, let's get started. Josh Gibson was a Negro League baseball catcher, considered one of the most fearsome home run hitters to ever grab a bat. A star in the Negro Leagues two decades before integration, he was also known as the Black Babe Ruth. Gibson was considered to be the greatest baseball player never to have played in the major league. Gibson, born in December 21st, 1911 in Buena Vista, Georgia, but his family moved to Pittsburgh in the 1920s during the Great Migration. By his teenage years, he and his father worked in the coal mines and he would later study to be an electrician before dropping out of trade school in 1927 to try his hand at semi-pro baseball. He started playing in Sandlot teams before playing with the city's top semi-pro team, the Pittsburgh Crawford Giants. He played with the Pittsburgh Crawfords through 1929, and in 1930, he joined the Homestead Grays. The story was that Josh was sitting in the stands when Cumberland Posey, owner of the Homestead Grays, called him into the game against the Kansas City Monarchs. They portrayed Gibson as an easygoing kid with the appetite of an elephant and catchphrases like, a homer a day would boost my pay, and I don't break bats, I wear them out. Cumberland Posey would later state that Gibson hit 60 home runs in 1930 and 72 in 1931. The real Gibson was not like the caricature. Unbeknownst to his teammates, Gibson had a 17-year-old wife by the name of Helen Mason. They lived on Bedford Ave and in August of 1930, she gave birth to twins, Josh Jr. and Helen Gibson. But she had convulsions during delivery, which resulted in kidney failure and she lapsed into a coma and died hours later. Gibson decided after this tragedy that he would avoid personal relationships that would end in the same pain. He was cold and short with almost everyone, including his young children who were raised by Helen's mother. They rarely saw Josh who decided to play baseball year round, spending his winters in the Caribbean rather than assuming his role as a father in Pittsburgh. Baseball would provide a refuge for its insecurities, but later his issues would lead to strange and reckless behavior. But for right now, Josh would continue to wear out bats and pitchers. In 1932, he jumped from the Homestead Grays to Gus Greenlee's famous Pittsburgh Crawfords. Gibson teamed up with Satchel Paige and they created the best battery of all time in the majors or the Negro Leagues. Satchel Paige would strike out 15 batters and Josh Gibson would hit two home runs and it was just a normal day for the Pittsburgh Crawfords. In 1933, he hit 55 home runs and 239 RBIs and he did it all for $400 a month. By 1936, Gibson and third baseman Judd Johnson was traded back to the Grays and in return the Crawfords got $2,500. One of the greatest pitchers of all time, Walter Johnson said, there was any catcher in the big league club that I would like to buy for $200,000, it would be Gibson. He can do everything. He can hit the ball a mile. He catches easy. He might as well be in a rocking chair and throws like a rifle. Bill Dickey is not a good catcher. Precise records of Gibson's accomplishments are hard to come by because of lack of statistical keeping and press coverage in the Negro Leagues. Gibson took part in a vast number of exhibition games and games against semi-pro teams, but it's believed that he led the Negro Leagues in home runs for 10 consecutive seasons and had a batting average of 365. He reportedly hit 84 home runs in 1936 and amassed almost 800 career home runs, although only 236 of those are officially recorded. One account exists of Gibson making old Yankee Stadium seem almost small, supposedly hitting a ball 880 feet into the upper reaches of the bleachers or knocking out of the ballpark completely. Gibson's catching ability was also praised by minor league clubs whom he played in exhibition games. He also had a 426 batting average recorded against major league pitchers in those same contests. But there was no shortage of tragedy in Gibson's life. In 1941, Gibson quit the Homestead Grays only days after signing a new contract to sign a contract for $800 a month for the Mexican League Veracruz team. Gibson's excursion to Mexico took a toll on him physically. 
already a heavy drinker, he and his Ferry Cruz teammate Sam Bankhead openly guzzled case after case of case of verdict in the dugout between games. And although booze could not stop him on the field, while in Mexico, he began to toy with even harder drugs and heroin. The turning point in Gibson's life was his relationship with his wife, Hattie Gibson. She kept his abusive tendencies from lurching out of control. But when they separated in the early 40s, Gibson began a relationship with Grace Frontier, who was the opposite of Hattie Gibson. She was a heavy drinker and a, and a known narcotics user. And during games, she would sit in the stands, chain smoking and shivering even on the hottest days. As the Negro Leagues were declining, so was Josh Gibson's health. Bother by stabbing headaches in 1942, he assumed they were from hangovers. But on January 1st, he blacked out and fell into a six-hour coma. Josh and Seb Gibson needed to rest, but it was vice that he ignored and went on to hit 526 in 1943. But the following year in 1944, Gibson had become noticeably drained, causing a lack of hitting power. Gone with the long home runs, and he only hit 14 home runs total over the next two seasons. But he still had a 393 batting average in 1945, so many believe he was simply adjusting his game due to his age and his lifestyle. Cumberland Posey's management, Cumberland Posey's management hid most of the news of Gibson's obsession with alcohol and heroin, and because of this, Gibson rarely faced any scrutiny from the black press. In 1943, when he had blacked out, it was not simply due to exhaustion. He had a brain tumor and doctors had told him it was terminal. Not once did Gibson let on about his declining health and when on the ball field, he was able to summon all his energy to give a passable imitation of the old destructible Josh. In 1946, suffering from headaches and dizzy spells and seizures, he seemed to be preparing himself for the end and made a belated attempt to recover a life he had long left behind. Gibson attempted to repair his relationship with Josh Jr., but Josh Jr. refused to accept financial help and the atonement failed. In January 20th, 1947, Josh Gibson died what was called a stroke. Gibson's funeral was held at Macedonia Baptist Church and drew hundreds of mourners and his death became to great shock to many who thought they knew him well but really didn't know him at all. Less than three months after his passing, Jackie Robinson debuted for the Brooklyn Dodgers, breaking the color barrier and ushering a new era for the sport. But Gibson sadly was not around to see it. He would be elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1972, but this was not the end for Josh Gibson's legacy since the Negro League stats are now a part of MLB official record. Gibson is now has the second highest batting average at 365 in MLB history behind Ty Cobb at 366. His on-base percentage at 449 ranks fifth and he now is one of 12 players with an on base slugger percentage over a thousand and gives his 1943 season when he hit 441 now qualifies as MLB's new single season record for batting average.